we have a good good uh good showing of many folks many familiar faces welcome everyone um we're really excited uh to show you uh you a really exciting project um uh, but first um maybe our introductions for our bsa group i'm cindy lee um a co-chair at the bsa healthcare facilities committee um brayden do you want to go sure um and i'm brayden reed and incoming co-chair for the 2023-24 year with the BSA Healthcare Facilities Committee. And I'm Andrew Birnbach, uh, also a co-chair of the uh, BSA Healthcare Facilities Committee. All right, thank you very much. I'm gonna do quick introductions to our presenters this evening and then I'll uh, hand it off to them to share this exciting project. Um, so with us this evening, we have uh, Patricia Nobre, uh, who is a principal at Gensler. Uh, she's the director of Gensler's Boston, Strat Boston Strategy Lab. Um, Patricia leads a multidisciplinary team dedicated to helping organizations across industries thrive in times of change through design for a range of possible futures, obviously highly relevant in today's healthcare landscape. Um, spanning science, healthcare, education, and workplace, her work is driven by a fundamental belief in the human experience of belonging. She's passionate about understanding the lived experience of others to better design the spaces, policies, and cultures that will shape healthier, more resilient, and more equitable communities. A recognized leader in the research and design of radically inclusive spaces, Patricia is steadfast in balancing data and real voices through deep user engagement. She holds a Master of Education from Harvard University, a Master of Architecture from the University of Massachusetts, and a Bachelor's Degree in Architecture and Urban Planning, two Bachelor's Degrees from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, we also have from Gensler, Matthew Tharp. Matthew brings two decades of experience to his role of Associate and Design Manager and Leader of Gensler's Healthcare Practice Area. His passion for managing projects and teams to achieve a sense of ownership among project staff and ensure timely on-budget delivery is second to none. He enjoys working with clients, design and construction teams, as well as civic and regulatory agencies from project conception through construction and closeout. Matthew's expertise spans a wide range of project types, including the healthcare, retail, and life science sectors. He's a registered architect in the state of Massachusetts and holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the BAC. Um, and Teresa, was has Teresa been able to join us yet? Yeah, yeah. I, I got yeah. blocked. Oh. Hi, of, oh. <laughs> okay, sorry, Took welcome. Times. Welcome, welcome, glad Thank you're you. here. Um, and, and last but not least is Teresa William uh, Wilson, who yep. has over 30 years of experience exp um, managing design and planning for healthcare and community projects. As a director at Collier's uh, Project Leaders, Teresa's role as an owner's project manager involves working closely with owners to understand and ensure their project goals are incorporated throughout the design and are reflected in the final project. She is skilled in leading des uh, decision-making sessions using lean tools and other collaborative processes. Throughout Teresa's career, she has volunteered her time and expertise as a member of her town's permanent building committee reviewing current projects and working with the Healthcare Associated Infections Organization, HAIO, to, sorry, I've got a, a cat on my lap, um, to organize and facilitate 20 plus public sessions with healthcare executives and architects addressing concerns um, during the pandemic and beyond. Teresa was a chapter oh. chair for the white paper um, by the FGI, guide, the Facilities Guidelines Institute, um, guidance for designing health and residential care facilities that respond and adapt to emergency conditions. Teresa is an architect, member of the AIA and the ACHA, and she is also a Fitwell ambassador. So welcome to the three of you. I'm going to mute Thank myself you. and turn it over to our presenters. Before you uh, turn over, um, one quick thing. We do have a link for CEUs. Uh, we applied and we should we should re we should be getting uh, health and safety, uh, HSW and um, those credits. And then if you have uh, questions during the presentation, please type it in into the chat um, and the team uh, between Teresa and Christina and the team and Tricia, um, 
they'll field the uh, questions to whoever is best to answer it. Okay. Yeah, and just at the top, um, just want to say that we really would like this to be uh, kind of very conversational. So don't hold your com your questions until the end. Feel free to jump in so we can really get some engagement and some uh, dynamic conversation. Thank you. Awesome. So it's really exciting when a project, I think never has like the human factor been such a driving point of how we're designing and how we think about what, what design is and how healthcare and especially in the realm of health, how do you create a space that reimagines what we think of healthcare to be much more around providing health than providing care. And it's much more about the whole human, the whole person. And that was a lot of the premise where this project started off and MGB and its thought leadership and saying, how can we design a space that delivers health care differently? Um, um, and we can keep going, Christina. Thanks. And really this idea of it is a space and we want to share about what happened within the space, but a lot of the context and the strategies that drew this is how do you, this idea of how do you design to the edges? How do you look to dismantle this idea of who is this average patient or this average healthcare provider and think we wanted to really design to those extreme characteristics, the person who avoids healthcare and never comes in, the person who's always in healthcare. And how do you think of this as a community, a place where you feel known and understood as a full human being? And how does design help you do that? And I think as designers and as architects, we know that every space we design either helps or hinders the sense of who, who belongs there and tells a story about who are the folks that belong there and who are the folks that don't. So it was really powerful and we're excited to be able to share with you what materialized out of all of that. And this was a big project that involved a lot of stakeholders. So let Matt also talk a little bit about all the key the players that um, played a role in this one. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because we actually have a few of them on the line today. Um, you know, I see Anna and Michael, Tim King. Um, so, and then obviously uh, Teresa and Patricia. So, um, yeah, we had a lot of partners in this. Uh, started with the client, um, the entire consultant team, and Consigli was the contractor on this. Um, and uh, so, so all together, you know, the interesting thing is, is that you know, this this is called the integrated care facility, right, or the integrated care model. So, so, and and um, you know, we really. Uh, not only do we think we've achieved it here uh, in this healthcare setting, but also at the broader team in general um, was very integrated. Initially, we started out with the idea of uh, of, of all working together. You know, the, the the client team, the design team, the construction team, and the big room, and then COVID hit. So, you know, one thing to it's interesting to note is that this this building was designed and constructed almost entirely during that three year window in COVID. Um, so I think I think we're all quite proud of that. But uh, you know, we as as Patricia is saying, like, how do we, you know, how do how do we really kind of uh, you know take take a healthcare environment um, to the next level and and really you know what we like to call um, you know really make it radically human. Um, and I think we've done a pretty good job here. So we're really excited to share uh, with you today. So thanks so much for joining. Next slide. I think a lot of it was based on, you know, you start a project really on root of saying, not only where do you want to get to physically, but what's the experience? I think a lot, all of us are in this business of designing experiences. And we wanted experiences that people felt they had ownership of. They wanted an experience where we shifted some of those more traditional dynamics between healthcare providers and patients around the power structures of that, around who's the ownership of that space, and how do you create spaces that define health together? And that looks really different for different people. Now, what collaboration with a healthcare provider looks like and what are the spaces that facilitate that? We find that there isn't this one universal solution that says, you know, if, the, if it looks like this and if it's self-rooming and if it's more or less this size and if you're sitting next to the provider, that's really the experience that's going to allow for this. And we noticed that it looked really different. So this, a lot of the challenges around this is what became a modular solution that allowed for choice and allowed for spaces to be bigger or smaller and for teams to come in or patients to come in with their full family or with a translator or to come in individually and allow for that to be very bespoke to the patients while at the same time really stay away from this one universal, more inclusive design. Um, a lot of it became this idea of how do you integrate those in-between times? What does the weight room experience look like? And we'll share with you what that looks like. What is this moment between 
receiving a diagnosis and leaving the building? How do you arrive differently? And how do you provide for choice within those in-between moments? And really being intentional about that experience, not only about what's happening within a consult, but really all of the spaces in between. Mm -hmm. I, this idea that we are all experts and that a patient is the expert of themselves and what matters most to them and what they're valid, where they're coming from. And how do you honor that spatially as well? So um, you'll see a little bit of the art interventions and you'll see a bit of how do you transition from a space that feels really public to having a space that you have more ownership and that is more private from the loud to the quiet. And how do you honor the fact that this is really a space that all belong? Really about how do you be more, more predictive around what are the needs that are be forthcoming? How can this idea of being known so that you walk into a space, even if it is your first time there, that you feel it's intuitive in its flow, but it's also a space that you feel that the healthcare providers know you and create the space that is able to foresee a little bit where you see, you can see the vertical circulation, that wayfinding is very clear, um, not only through signage, but also through the architecture itself. And ultimately a space that catalyzes change. We know that even if we just, the best designed space is not, is gonna need to change the processes that we're using within that are changing, how we're hosting, technology is continually advancing. So how do you create a space that's really a platform for a future that neither, none of us really know? And how do you, and a lot of that became around how, what's the human engagement that we know? Spaces will change, um, technology will change, how healthcare is delivered will change. But there's this human element that is more consistent. So a lot of the design kind of came back to that. What's that greeting experience? What's that welcome map? And how can it be more around that? So excited to jump in as we start seeing some of these solutions as well. Yeah, and flexibility, you know, as, as Patricia mentioned, you know, flexibility both for, for what we know and what we don't was really one of the driving kind of um, principles of this project and, and, and that the client challenged us with, with providing. So, so you know, we, we tried very hard to account for um, uh, technologies that we don't know about yet, but also um, provide uh, spaces that are flexible for both providers as well as patients. Um, and, you know, so, so again, so they can take charge of their own care and, and really act as team members with the clinicians. So, and I think, you know, you start to see it here in the first floor plan um, where, you know, you arrive at the top of the plan um, and, you know, the first thing you'll notice is that this, this waiting area on, on level one, it's not really your typical waiting area, right? It's, it's, it was really intended to be much more, um, uh, you know, we, we tried to bring in a lot of different sectors uh, into the design here. So it, it didn't feel like a healthcare space. Because one of the things we did in our research was, you know, each and every one of us here is going to have to engage a health care space multiple times this year, probably, and certainly throughout our lives. And there are oftentimes spaces that, or your, you know, the experiences you have in these in these spaces are oftentimes unpleasant, right? Nobody wants to get bad news. Nobody wants to. So we're trying to soften things right out of the gate by, by you know, creating a, com a complete glass facade, a lot of connection from inside to outside. And then once you walk in, have a, a variety of different kinds of spaces uh, to part, you know, to, to, to either sit in and wait or, or, you know, you'll see we have a meeting room that opens up with the Nana wall that, that can become a large space for yoga or other community events. Um, so really trying to think of this facility not as, you know, your, 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 your dad's MOB, you know, that's what we did not want to do here. So, um, so, you know, just create a, a real variety of spaces. We have some food, a f food area, um, a lot of seating. And, and then of course, uh, the way we handled the art and the wall and the, the color, um, and, and the, the furniture design, um, all kind of integrated and, and tied into that concept. So um, yeah, I don't know. Should I take them through just like a quick rundown of the program, probably? Yeah. Or do you think? Okay, so that sounds great. So, yeah. So again, you know, as as an integrated care model, the intent here was to um, was to you know, as as the name says, kind of integrate the care, make make the the, the care team uh, include both uh, patient and provider. So on level one, uh, we have our primary imaging services and our primary lobby space. Um, and so, you know, we've got in terms of uh, clinical modalities, we've got a woman's center that includes ultrasound and mammogram, uh, a couple general ultrasound rooms, uh, a couple x-ray rooms, two MRIs, uh, CTs, and then all the support spaces that go along with that. Um, and, and as you enter each one of these spaces, you know, you can see how we start to pull the, the, the colored portals, uh, you know, to, to create a sense of arrival and a sense of entry in, into the different parts of the building. Um, and then, of course, we've also got on level one, um, you know, the, the, the kind of the 
I, I guess, you know, the loading dock and some of the more, um, you know, building service type spaces as well. So I don't know, Teresa, would you like to talk about uh, some of the furniture here on the on level Well, one? I think when we get to the images of the furniture, I'll jump in. Why don't you okay. go through the plan? Okay. All right. So, you know, that's level one. I think the space that, um, the, that we're not seeing that we'll see in a later slide um, is is uh, some of the exterior that you're not seeing here. And we also, as part of this, um, really tried to pull the, ex you know, the inside out and the outside in um, with the heavy use of glass, heavy use of landscaped areas. Uh, places for respite, um, you know, healing garden, uh, that sort of thing. Another thing I want to mention is that this this program was developed as a prototype. Um, and so what we're seeing here is uh, the prototype as it was applied in Salem, New Hampshire. Um, but there were also a couple other sites here in Massachusetts that unfortunately we did not get to build um, that, that, you know, were a little, this is, this is more of kind of an urban setting. Um, but uh, in, in New Hampshire, but in uh, in Woburn and Westboro, uh, they were more rural. And so uh, we really um, were able to uh, take advantage of, of some of that in terms of the outdoor space and how it interacts with the indoors. So we can go to the second floor here. Um, so here we've got uh, the, the what you know, the clinics and uh, we've got four primary pods. Um, you can see we're using the Virginia Mason here uh, model here with the on stage off stage. Um, and so we we uh, we created 30 exam rooms uh, with uh, four uh, care team uh, uh, spaces that we'll get into in a little more detail later. But again, you know, the use of color, the use of arrival, uh, you can see the vertical circulation there at the top is a grand stair that, that we'll see a little later that that really runs uh, all three levels, uh, you know, and again, in an effort to integrate the care. So the idea is, is if, you know, say you, you you know, you, um, uh, you, you, you tear your ACL, right? You come in, you see your doctor on level two, then you can go down to level one and get imaged. Um, and then you can go up to level three and get it operated on back to level two for the physical therapy space. So, you know, the idea of if every, all of the care that you need in an ambulatory setting in one space, one place, um, that, that allows uh, your, your care team to collaborate very effectively, um, allows you to collaborate with them and uh, really creates, um, you know, what we, we often call the kind of a hospital without beds. You know, it's got a lot of, a lot of the clinical services um, that, uh, that you find in a hospital. Um, and, uh, you know, that was the intent was to kind of decant these, these uh, services from the hospital setting, from the urban setting and, so and pull them into the suburbs. And Matt, I just want to talk a little bit about the exam rooms because I saw Tim King on the line. We did we did extensive work on these. Um, it's a dirt system. We did mock-ups, uh, two rooms, full-size mock-up off-site. Um, we had the clinical team um, cycling in and giving comments uh, over, I don't know, I think a couple of months, right, Matt? Yeah, at least. Um, and then um, the HGA HGA team came in and we did virtual reality to help people understand what the the workspaces would feel like because there was a big concern they're you know they're pretty pretty small spaces but they they all got a comfort level with that once we did that you know the the walkthrough and we had we actually had that physically mocked up too so that the the way the the workstations and the exam rooms interacted was really well thought out process it took quite a bit of time and you know, MGB invested a lot of energy in, in making sure we got it right, which I I think you know the end product is is really successful. Yeah, and and you know related to dirt and and the demountable partitions. So all of our all of our exam spaces here are made up of the the dirt wall system and and the idea. And we'll we'll see some slides later that talk about being able to scale up or scale down these spaces um, to again be flexible and you know maybe maybe in the future we need a larger exam room so we take out a center wall and we have two modules become one um and uh, it was a really successful relationship we had with uh, working with dirt um and being able to provide these flexible spaces that i think the, the clinicians in particular are very excited about the way this this turned out so okay why don't we go to the next slide so this is level three where we have our asc uh, so it's, um, you know, four operating rooms with uh, 15 PACI bays there at the top. You can see 
Um, you come into the lobby uh, off the elevator lobby in the third floor, um, and uh, you go into the PACU, um, then into the operating room, back into the PACU. Fairly typical uh, arrangement in that regard. Um, and then it also has a full SPD uh, down there in the uh, lower right-hand corner. Um, in the lower left-hand corner, you can see this is um, this is the staff space. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we can see we've got a very generous staff lounge because, again, this isn't, you know, we're, we're trying to make the staff experience, um, uh, you know, uh, feel better as well. Um, and then staff lockers uh, and, and toilet facilities. So, but again, you know, working with the vertical circulation, uh, the spaces within a space, um, you know, we did do some things in the planning where, you know, we kinked walls and things like that, uh, corridors down on level one. Um, so, uh, and, and also, you know, views to the exterior from the lobby. One of the things we, we um, strive very hard to do in the design was bring natural light into the packing spaces, because as we all know, you know, light is a very healing element and um, can really change the way someone feels about their current situation. So, each one of the packy bays does have a window in it. Um, and so, uh, you know, getting those head walls correct with the windows, you know, sometimes the windows are on the left, sometimes they're on the right, but getting all those correct and um, modular, uh, you know, was all prefabbed uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, the kind of armatures they brought in for med gases and everything um, and popped into these walls. It was a, quite a challenge, but we also uh, mocked those spaces up as well, full scale. Um, and had several several discussions with, um, uh, I think we, what did we see, Teresa, during the mock-up? Uh, something like, you know, 25 different clinical groups came in. And, and mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it was a really extensive effort to do that. And then, you know, of course, in the PACU, the, the nurse station centrally located there to, to provide um, sight lines to each each bay. I think, um, Matt, one, one thing um, that was really challenging on this project is that the eye care team was onboarding continuously through the entire design. Mm -hmm. So things would have to be reevaluated and re-explained. And I'm sure everybody knows how that is on this call. But it it was this is basically the forming of a new healthcare service. So it's it's starting from the ground up. And you have a mm -hmm. lot of people coming from a lot of different places. And that that was a really challenging part of this project and of kind of making sure people were heard and making sure they understood that a decision had been made, but we can still reevaluate if they have something to add. And um, it was to the nth degree on this project, of <laughs> <laughs> bringing, bringing people in continuously. It, it, it was, and, and I don't know, Matt, if you want to talk about that AHC process, that kind of. The triple a, AHC. Yeah. yeah so it's kind of a last yeah, think... thing. Anybody, anybody that's done uh, an ASC, you know, in addition to the the typical licensure that we're all used to, um, you know, the AS, a, ASCs um, have uh, have a, a, a separate um, a licensure process. It's very similar. Um, primarily revolves around um, protocols, clinical protocols, and things like that. But there's also some physical space considerations that that they look into. Most of them are based on the FGI guidelines, um, so they're. You know, if, if you've got FGI covered, then then you're well on your way. But they do have also some unique uh, unique requirements as well as far as the physical spaces are concerned. So, um, you know, as Teresa mentioned, this is a new business model for MGB. And so, uh, you know, we all learned quite a bit in, in this process, um, both in terms of onboarding staff while during construction um, and getting new opinions and new viewpoints uh, that, that then made their way into the design. Um, but also, you know, with some of the licensure process that we had to go through, um, you know, we had the Triple HC. We we had designed things a, a little differently uh, in a few different areas. Um, but uh, as we got deeper into the Triple HC process, um, had to change them. So, you know, uh, the building was flexible uh, or was designed to be flexible. The care models designed to be flexible, and we had to be flexible as well as we went through this process. So, um, you know, it's it's uh, I think, but at the end of the day. Uh, what we ended up with uh, was what I think is is a really amazing product. Yeah, the the other and I hate to be the you know always talking about the complications, but the other complication we had was DHHS instead of DPH. You know, mm -hmm. 
um, their main reviewer retired during this process in COVID, during COVID. So there was a big void of who, of understanding who was going to review it, how the process went. And that, that took quite a bit of time too. And Matt and I were heavily involved in that, um, looking at water quality, all sorts of things. It did get resolved, but um, it kind of made me appreciate uh, Massachusetts DPH a little bit more. <laughs> it's, it's, so, it's so easy yeah, to understand what they want. And they um, spell but, it out for you, yeah. Exactly. So, so you know, there are all sorts of things that, that we all had to kind of step up to the plate and learn. Um, mm -hmm. Now we know. Yeah, indeed. So, so now that we've been through kind of the floor plans and everything, I just want to pause here and see if anybody has any any questions so far, or should we just keep rolling? So, since, so, so there's a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy Weitzner wanted to know if we mocked up the ORs too. Um, Matt, you want to take that? Yeah, we didn't mock up the OR um, the way we did the, um, you know, the the PACU Bay or the um, uh, the, the the clinics uh, on level two. Um, we did, however, um, you know, when once they got some studs up and everything, we did some kind of in place in situ mockups. Um, but it was not the same process in the big room that that we went through uh, with uh, the other spaces I mentioned. And then uh, Millie Baker asked about specific technology innovations that affect the building design. Um, just okay, well, yeah, I, yeah I'll just do the exam room really quickly. And I know Matt, you can probably talk more. Is that telehealth? You know, everybody experienced that during the pandemic. And there's, I don't know, I think it's a 55 inch screen that's in the exam rooms. Mm -hmm. So getting that to be a non threatening presence in the exam room um, and, you know, where it was located, that all was heavily um, discussed during the exam uh, uh, mock ups. Um, so just technology wise, there's a lot of bells and whistles um, that that I haven't seen in other organizations, um, just really having the ability to have remote visits with the patients in the exam rooms, which you know yeah. we're all learning about, but I know Matt, other things that you might want yeah, to- Yeah, Christina, around? could you go back one slide if you don't mind? So, so you can see, as, as Teresa mentioned, we had, uh, you know, we telehealth capabilities in the exam rooms themselves. And one of the interesting things, uh, just kind of a funny aside there is, when they brought in the system, um, the, the the folks over at MGB, when they brought in the kind of you know the the AV system setup that they were planning on using, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the camera, right, in an exam, yeah. and whether or not that's going to make people uncomfortable. And so, yes. a lot of time spent uh, talking about, well, if I'm sitting here in my Johnny, do I really want a big camera eye staring at me? So. You know, a lot of these discussions went on, but um, uh, we also have spaces and you can kind of, you know, you can see them, I don't have a pointer here, but you can see them kind of at the bottom of these uh, care team spaces, uh, those small rooms. So those are phone rooms that um, that, that we designed also able to, um, uh, to provide telehealth services in addition to just privacy for staff uh, if they, if they, you know, need to make a personal phone call. But, um, you know, with the Everybody understanding that telehealth, um, you know, it, it exploded during COVID, and I think it's receded a little bit. But I think everybody understands that it's 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 only going to get more prominent. So um, so we provided, you know, on <clears throat> excuse me, on this floor we've got um, you know eight eight to nine uh, of those small phone rooms that are telehealth capable, as well as um, all of the exam rooms. Uh, one of the other technologies that was, was that was explored here, um, but has not yet been implemented, is the idea of self rooming. So that's one of the things that we found so attractive about the Virginia Mason model was the ability to self room. Um, but you know that that runs into some uh, technology um, you know challenges, I should say. Um, so, but that's another one of the uh, another one of the technological advances that we're that we 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 put the framework in place. And so now it's just a matter of uh, getting working through uh, some of the finer points. Um, Cindy has a question. What were some of the special ASC requirements you didn't anticipate? Um, I'll just, one, one quick thing is that this was in the pandemic and there was all the supply chain issues. So the um, MGB took the, um, the had decided to have a pre, a, rent a warehouse, I'm not quite sure if they rented or bought, and hired a logistic group to 
have all of the equipment and furniture, everything as much as possible delivered there as soon as it was ordered and held so that you didn't have to wait and, um, you know, potentially not get it in time. There are still, there's still some glitches from that, but that was a critical decision made during the pandemic as everybody saw what was happening to make sure that we could get what we needed during the appropriate construction time. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, Christina, you can go back to the third floor, uh, one slide forward, if you don't mind. Um, as far as the special ASC requirements that we didn't anticipate, um, one particular one that was related to the Triple HC was um, at the top of the Grand Stair. Um, you know, that entire wall, uh, the interior wall, uh, was intended to be glass. And we had set it up so it was, you know, um, uh, code compliant, um, uh, you know, um, and and came up with a solution that, that, you know, everybody agreed Code Red was our code consultant on the project, was, was code compliant and fine. Uh, but Triple HC has... Has some very, um, you know, in, in code compliant with regard to how we were protecting the glass for fire, um, and so we ended up going to a solid wall there because there was some some discussion back and forth. We had a kind of a pre meet with with uh, some retired Triple H C reviewers, site reviewers, and they they pointed they flagged that as you know, depending on the reviewer you get, you may run into some issues here. So. Unfortunately, we had to lose a little of the natural light infiltration into the lobby space and into that subwaiting space between the lobby and the PACU. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was decided that that was something uh, that we didn't want to uh, pursue, uh, given some of the timing and, and when they were looking to open up the surgical spaces uh, and start taking cases. So that was like <laughs> one Triple HC specific thing that was a surprise to us. So Danielle has a question about the clinics, and I know, Patricia, you were working on that quite a bit, um, about the natural light um, for the clinic, interior clinic work areas and how, how that was discussed point. and That's what was accomplished. That's a great point and really challenging with the Virginia Mason model in the way, right, as they're enclosed and, and, and that characteristic. That was a big consideration of how we bring light and keep privacy in there. Um, fair point that I don't think they do all have equal access to lighting. It's a Can natural you go back lighting to the room. second floor. Yep. Thanks, Christina. Great. So if you see those ones that are a big point of the was to there therefore allowed that as patients they do have access to the lighting in the in the towards the south side of the plan. So as they're walking around and walking into, there's always that we made sure that oh, there was a big intentionality around the hallways always having the light glare coming in. Um and balancing that in that way to some degree, both a little bit to the front, and definitely more towards the south of the plan but um, was one of the considerations and really much, very much discussed around what are the trade-offs there and how do some of them have more light than others and, as well. And you guys built a really nice um, staff space on that bottom corridor right. that people can hang out and you know, really mm -hmm. comfortable seating. And, and the, the view is beautiful. It's a, a forest across the street, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know the staff yeah. experience was a big piece that was thought about. And like, do we have one consolidated space? How do people come together? What is the space to decompress? And um, especially from a mental health perspective, was very much discussed as well. How do we bring those components in? Um, yeah, and it's, it's we haven't done a full post occupancy evaluation, but um, just in in the work that we're continuing to do up there, the the, the staff is just thrilled uh, with with these spaces. Given all of the natural light, they just love it. You know, it's not. Something that I think, as we as we all know, it's not something you typically see. Um, so they get to sit there and, and and work in the sunshine all day, and so um, they're quite happy with that. Which you know, it, it really makes a huge difference uh, in terms of you know the experience that both uh, staff and patient uh, are able to get. Yep. I think that's um, it for the questions. Oh, okay. Wait. wait, we got a we got a big one from Michael Lorimer. <laughs> Ah, uh, Mr. Lorimer, how are you? <laughs> well, maybe, Michael, you can just ask the question. And it's not a question, actually. It's, it's trying to respond to the question about innovation as well, I think, from Millie, that you raised just about technology. Mm -hmm. And just to basically echo what Matt said and what you've all been saying about um, flexibility. You know, there were lots of different users with lots of different opinions about uh, what they want to see now, what they want to see in the future. And so part of that uh, on the IT and the AV side was about providing a flexible infrastructure 
and solution that will allow MGB to add more and more technology over time as they sort of develop their operating model, as they learn to use the building, as they learn to use the prototype as well. So yeah, there were lots of discussions about can we interface this system with this system? And you know, we were asking about, well, what do you want to do with that interface? How do you want it to work? And so um, yeah, so just about flexibility on the IT side to, to sort of give them the the option for doing more and more as they uh, as they use the building. Yeah. So Michael Michael Lorimer was uh, was the project lead for Arup, who was the uh, the MEP engineer on the job. So thanks, Michael. No problem. Okay. So why don't we dive into uh, some of the other slides here? So. Um, and I think Teresa, this is probably a good spot to talk about furniture. But the orange stair there on the right—that's that's the grand stair that runs the entire, um, you know, levels one, two, and three through the building, right up against the front facade. And again, trying, you know, integrating the the building vertically um, and really creating this connective tissue uh, between the the three primary, um, uh, you know, kind of clinical floors. Uh, in addition to providing people with, um, you know, just an, an opportunity to uh, take the stairs instead of the uh, the elevator, and and uh, you know perhaps uh, get get some extra steps in. So, do you want to talk about the furniture? Yeah. So, system? so part of my job throughout the process was bringing on new team members. Um, so, for furniture, we had HGA and they um, and COP, and we had signage with Salbert Perkins and artwork with LFA management. And it was a very strong mandate to make sure everything integrated with the Gensler design. Um, and we would, that was the basis of, uh, you know, the color palettes, the design intent. So you can see the signs. There was huge discussion about the sign and the um, the font, they didn't, the first couple of times, they thought it looked like something from the MBTA. And it took, it took, it took a long time for people to get it. And I think it's really successful how it integrates. You know, it's got the wood and the color that just really works well with the entire aesthetics of the project. And that was the mandate, you know, integrate as much as possible. And we had, we had um, collaborative meetings with um, everybody together presenting to the client. So Gensler would, um, you know, lead these things and they would review what was being uh, presented by the other uh, consultants. Uh, so it was a great team effort and um, it, it's probably the, mo the best integrated project in terms of colors, artwork, furniture, um, and signage that I've, I've seen. Uh, at least since I, you know, or worked on in all my career, um, part of the artwork, I'm, I'm just going to do a little dive in each other. The artwork was really important. There was an art committee. Um, LFA Art Management was um, tasked with finding artists. Um, the art committee really wanted to represent New Hampshire and New Hampshire artists um, and local artists. So it was uh, a search that happened and um, we all looked at many, many pieces of artwork, but everything that was put together was so thoughtfully designed to integrate with um, within the building. It, it's just a really seamless and um, uh, aesthetic. Uh, the furniture was a big deal. I worked with Anna Mancini and HGA on that uh, in terms of incrementally bringing up the standards for the vendors um, in terms of sustainability and resiliency and that was a huge task to kind of create a uh, RFP for vendors that would reflect this, the goals of the um, sustainability goals of the team. Um, it was a huge learning curve for all of us on how to put together an RFP for that um, and what you can expect. And we basically found, you know, we got a lot of different answers from a lot of different groups. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a wild west out there with how you get information about sustainability and furniture, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, th I think it was a really a great step in the right direction and a, and a big learning curve for me, at least on how to do that. I'm still, I'm still trying to understand that completely. Um, so sustainability and diversity criteria were very important, um, in the furniture and the installation and, and the manufacturing all the way through and circularity. Um, and then I think, uh, just to make sure I covered everything. 
Oh, and I don't want to forget LEED just because that was a huge deal too. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that was the green engineer. Yeah, so you can see in, you know, one of the things that was really important to, to both the client as well as, as us and, uh, and you know, that the concept of, you know, meeting some of the, some of the, the, the larger aspirations of, of the project and the prototype was, was again to, to, you know, you can see it here in this photograph quite well that, you know, this is not the kind of waiting room that you typically see, you know, we, we leveraged, um, you know, our hospitality sector um, uh, designers and, um, you know, to, to, to really make this space feel um, non-clinical, you know, because again, people are nervous when they come into these facilities. And so, you know, um, providing space that could calm them and that, that could make them feel at home, uh, you know, the liberal use of wood and stone and uh, bright colors, you know, all of these things, um, I think, you know, kind of differentiates it from, from what you might typically see in an MOB setting. Um, and so very proud of, of how that all came together. And you can see it all kind of working together here uh, quite well. So there's a question. Is there something functionally unique about the waiting room? So maybe you want to talk about, Matt, how, you know, related to waiting for the clinic spaces. Yeah. So, you know, we, we looked at waiting as kind of, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, in, in, like, you know, you can see how different the seating is here, right, than, than what you might typically see in a waiting room. And so, and then also on levels one, two, and three, we kind of looked at the waiting throughout the space, throughout the building as an aggregate. Um, and so, you know, while you look here and you think that there may not be enough chairs to satisfy FGI requirements and that sort of thing, we ended up satisfying all of those requirements uh, with our layout, but we did it, um, you know, by breaking the waiting up and and providing uh, you know, much more um, comforting and, and welcoming uh, seating options. You know, you can see that there are a few different, just in this photo, you can see we've got some high back chairs and some desks and some some uh, some couches. So really we're looking to make the waiting experience more comfortable, um, uh, more pleasing um, for 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 the patients and their and their families as well. So it, it was it was unique uh, the way we handled it in, in terms of looking at it all in aggregate. Um, you know, when we will talk a bit more in depth about DPH and, and the FGI guidelines in a little bit, but, um, but, you know, we did, we did end up satisfying all the requirements, but I think we did it in a way that when at first glance, you wouldn't think that it does, but it does. So that was so great. Just to answer really quickly and go, and we'll get back to it, but we, we, um, we're, we're going, obviously we wanted gold, lead gold, but um, we ended up um, going for lead silver. We can talk about that a little bit later. And there was another question about um, from Brandon Reed. Did you have to fit in with any existing material graphic facility furniture standards, or did this establish a new standard? So there were there were um, since I care was a new group, um, the signage was reviewed. They they were undergoing a rebranding, so there was a lot of scrutiny over what that meant for the signage. Um, in terms of making sure it met the standards of that, the finishes um, and furniture standards. Um, I think there, I don't know if Anna's on the on still, but we, you know, we, yep. um, I think we have pretty free reign, um, but there were some standards in terms of um, finishes for cleanability and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we did a very comprehensive um, review of the standards and looking at um, you know the sustainability piece. And I will add that all these items, you know, the 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 style and the material and the upholsteries and finishes, all were healthcare based, uh, healthcare appropriate, but also met those sustainability and um, environmental, you know, no chemicals of concern and all that. So it was all well thought out. Yeah, and, and Mass General has, you know, a, a pretty rigorous set of standards. So while, you know, we were able to deviate perhaps with product and things like that, performance was never, we never deviated from their performance standards, um, you know, so, so again, uh, just a, a real team effort um, by everyone involved to, to meet the performance goals while also meeting the design intent uh, and, and the larger project aspirations. And, and John Missouri was particularly involved in the furniture yes, sustainability yeah. process. Um, mm -hmm. So it was um, it was 
a very intense project process. Mm -hmm. Anna well, smiling. Keep keep running through. Uh, yeah. So with the color strategy, you know, we, we again, pu you know, public to private considerations in inside out considerations. Um, you know, we paid a lot of attention to that, and so you know, as you go through the building, you can see these diagrams here. Um, you know, on level one, uh, you know, at the front, we've got a very generous amount of public space. Um, and then as you go back toward, you know, into the building uh, on, on all the levels, um, you know, you've got your initial private space up front um, and then it gets or pu rather public space up front. And then it gets it, it, it kind of gradiates to, to more private space, um, both horizontally on each floor, as well as vertically through the building. You can see on level three. Uh, where we have ORs and you're, you know, you're literally open, right? Um, and the PACU, um, you know, much more private space, much more secluded. Um, and then on level one, where we're really trying to draw the community in, um, you know, much more emphasis on the public. And then the color strategy really followed that, uh, that move in, in terms of, you know, up front in the public, very warm and welcoming colors, uh, you know, and then it gradiates as you get into more private spaces into some more, uh, you know, cooler, uh, calming colors um, to, you know, so so we really tried, again, to integrate all aspects of this design and the color strategy was certainly one of those. Um, and then, of course, we've got our big bright orange stair uh, running up through the building, um, which is my favorite piece of the building, probably. So kudos from Inga for the uh, red and oranges. Yes, indeed. <laughs> The, the stair was originally going to be yellow, but that that, yeah. that was a big topic of discussion and it, it ended up being this color. But yeah, we, we had a couple primary people on the MGB side that actually, you know, could not stand yellow. And as you as I think we all know, you know, color people have a very, very visceral reaction to color. So, um, you know, the color conversations were uh, were very lively. And uh, but I think we ended up uh, exactly where it should be here. So, next slide, Christina. So this is this is uh, the main the main piece of artwork. It extends from the ground floor all up to the third, and you can see it from outside the building from a distance away. It was designed by um, Sylvia Lopez Chavez, who's done uh, murals throughout the city and many many projects. So she she presented um, to the art committee a couple of times, and you can see the the New Hampshire references throughout they don't hit you in the face they're just really well integrated um and it it you know we had a lot of discussions on how literal it should be you know it's the big the big thing in salem is what what's that amusement park there um canopy lake <laughs> so they were talking about that at the very beginning it's like no she just she just had a, a you know a really great understanding of how to present it um the the foliage and the vistas and the map itself um, and and she paid extraordinary attention to the colors within the building um, so it's it's really a lively um, part of the floor plate or the elevations yeah and I, I think you know bringing in the 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 local subject matter um, you know was again an attempt to uh, to really create some connective tissue with the larger community um, and, uh, and I think it was quite successful. And then you can see here the photograph of, uh, again, the, 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 the furniture arrangements as well as the art um, and then the views to the outside. So this, this was built on the uh, old, um, uh, what is it? It's a racetrack. A racetrack. Uh, yeah, it's, it's an old racetrack and they, 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 they created this entire development, Tuscan Village. So, and this is one of, we're one of the anchor tenants right there at their front door. So it's quite nice. Next slide. So here you can see in the site plan, uh, you know, the, the 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 healing garden restorative terrace that we were discussed that I discussed earlier. Um, so you know, again, um, connecting to the to the outside to the larger outside community, uh, and um, you know, uh, you know, we even talked about perhaps having uh, food truck rodeos here and bringing in food trucks and um, to you know. Kind of make this not just an MOP, but somewhere that is is serves the larger community as a whole, whether whether you're going there for medical care or not. Um, and I think uh, I think it worked really well. You can see back we had uh, at the back we had the the reinforced turf 
um, for you know fire fire lane access, but uh, also in the um, we've got knockout panels in each of the CT and the MRI rooms. Um, so when they you know in the future and they need to do some equipment replacements, you don't have to tear the building apart to do it. You just um, uh, you just you pull pull the knockout panel, take your old equipment out, and put your new equipment in. I, I think it worked quite well. There's a question about the substrate for the graphics. What you see in the photos, I think, is a, a temporary wrap um, uh, because they were working on it. And I'm just drawing a blank on the name. It's a it's it's like um it's a pr protective wall panel which that you can incorporate artwork in onto it. And I know you guys out there know what it is. Aspect. There we go. There we Thanks, go. Thanks, Jessica. <laughs> just out there in brain brain. Couldn't get that one, but yeah. So it, it was uh, coordinating the manufacturing and the delivery. I don't know if it's even finally the final installation has happened yet. Um, Not but, yet. No. No. Yeah. We're still still waiting. Yeah. yeah. So and, and I know Children's. Uh, I think it, it um, Boston Children's Hospital uses that same system and it's held up really well. Mm -hmm. So this slide here is just talking about you know approach and entry the, at the restorative terrace. And you can see, you know, how uh, how important that connection is and, and the access to daylight both inside and out. Um, so, you know, we worked with uh, Mickey and Kim landscape architects on the project um, and they did, did did a phenomenal job of, of, of setting this up. And it's a really nice space and, you know, looking at the exterior furniture and the materials and, uh, you know, integrates very well with the entire design. Next slide. Yeah. So again, at the 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 front uh, lobby, uh, what we call the living room space. So you can just see kind of some of the spaces here that we had uh, the elevator lobby that we just looked at. Um, uh, you know, we we have some meeting spaces there. The one on the uh, the lower part of the axon. Uh, that's the primary meeting room space with the nano wall that then opens up into the larger lobby uh, for for large community gatherings or large trainings. Um, and then, uh, you know, food service area, as well as entries to uh, to to the imaging, uh, the imaging spaces behind. And this is uh, the, the main reception desk before before some of the equipment got installed. But um, but that's the main reception desk there. And then you can see the storefront interior storefront system there behind that is the phlebotomy uh, blood draw. Uh, we've got four four blood draw uh, bays as well as a, a processing lab there, so that's right right uh, across from the entry to the building. So it's you know if you're just going to get blood work done, you can come in and out. You don't have to traverse the entire building, and then you can see you know some of the artwork there and the signage and everything else that works quite well. So one one of the big things with the artwork is there's a, that big glass front in, um, facade of the building facing the parking. And the artwork, you can see the artwork um, on all three floors as you're standing in the parking lot. So it's really visible. I think it's a really welcoming um, feeling as you're coming into the building that you see this something that's a little bit different than what you'd normally would expect. And circulation, this is the yellow stair version. So this is uh, this is a, this this was the graphic that began the conversations, right? So, um, but you can just see the building section here and how it works. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is you can see in the photograph above um, how all of our corridors and circulation. You know, we ringed the building uh, with the corridor in an effort to bring light in and to to make the connection to the outside uh, more prominent for the user as they're walking through the space. This is on level two. Um, so, you know, I think it, think it worked quite well. Yeah, it was a big part of the wayfinding process, too. Mm -hmm. So this is where we, um, and look at that, Tim King, uh, just as, as though on cue. Um, so this is what we're <laughs> talking about with the... Uh, with the the you know the exam spaces and the modules that that we looked at, so we looked at you know um, your typical exam uh, is 120 square feet, and that's what we have currently in the plan. But through the use of dirt systems, uh, we were able to achieve a, a plan that could flex up and flex down, uh, to create consultation and meeting uh, telemedicine spaces, or we could do a, a larger 240 square foot uh, procedure and group visit. Um, so, you know, modularity, both in terms of how we handled 
some of the in interior spaces uh, with with this example in front of you, uh, as well as um, you know prefabrication uh, off site of some of the uh, the med gas armatures and other and other plumbing armatures, uh, as well as the exterior skin modularity was a big piece of this uh, a big piece of this again trying to be flexible efficient. Um, and and bring the highest quality product we could to 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 the to the client. You can see here we've got the MRI room, uh, one of the MRI rooms where we put uh, the sentient lighting system in. Um, so you know, again, trying to calm the patient uh, and um, you know, really try and make this this experience that you go through here um, as as you know. Uh, I guess least anxiety producing is possible. I don't know if any of you've ever been in an MRI, but it, it, it's not a terribly pleasant experience. So anything you can do to calm it down is, is I think, uh, uh, money well spent. You want to talk about this, Patricia? Yeah, so this is the um, care team living room. Um, this is, oh, this is their workspace. Mm -hmm. Or is this the oh this is a lounge, their, staff lounge, yeah, their sorry. staff lounge yeah mm -hmm. yeah in the in the corner of the um, building so you get this really great view um, throughout the um, the space you're on the third floor here so this was a big furniture discussion they wanted to make it as an alternate workspace too so have cozy furniture that could be you know slightly shifted around um, but. Uh, it's a very well used space um, and it's supported by that second floor um, staff area that we saw too and the exterior um, deck that they have so there's a couple of places where people can hang out but this was this was uh, an important space for them and they, they spent a lot of time at the furniture dealers looking and trying out different models of furniture that they thought would work well so I think it's an important part of the ecosystem, like that staff experience as well, as we mentioned earlier, right? Knowing yeah. that how do you balance it? It was important that this be a place that you could actually work from and not only a place to recharge for a lunch break and then have to go back to your other zone, allowing for choice, allowing for folks to be in here for longer if they needed to. Um, so it was a big piece of that. A lot of attention and conversations around it. Yeah, and this is the the primary, um, you know, kind of staff lounge for for all three floors. Um, so, you know, that's uh, you know, we had two different licenses here. One was a, the ASC license, uh, and then the the other license was for the clinics and the imaging as as one license. So, um, having a shared staff lounge across licenses, uh, you know, was something that we had to talk through with the regulators. Um, because it's not something you typically see. And back to that question earlier about um, anything, you know, about the ASC uh, in particular, you know, we we had a lot of discussions with Triple HC, um, and we had to, you know, kind of do some creative work with uh, with rated partitions and, and rated separations in order to make this work as, uh, you know, a lounge for the ASC as well as for the rest of the building. So, um, they just wanted to make sure that we were able to separate it from a life safety perspective uh, from from the other the other uh, portions of the building. So um, there was some regulatory work involved there. But um, again, this is one of the areas uh, in the building that uh, in our in our post occupancy work up there um, that really gets rave reviews from from the staff. Um, they just love it. And just to uh, go back to the second floor very quickly, Tim brought up a great point. Um, the early coordination for the mechanicals for the, the dirt system so they could be reconfigured. So that was a big part of the upfront planning for it. Yeah, there was a lot of work uh, with Tim and his team about um, uh, coordinating, um, you know, coordinating the, the the dirt systems and how are we using them, how are we integrating them with, with uh, the MEP systems and technology. A uh, lot of upfront work there, a lot of meetings uh, took place, um, you know, and it's a lot of upfront work, and then you come in, and, and the whole thing's built in, in in a matter of a couple months. So, um, you know, all that upfront work definitely paid off. So, so these, this is so oh, sorry, Teresa. Go ahead. That's all right. This, these are the co-working spaces that we talked about, where um, the we did the virtual reality to make sure people are okay. Um, I I haven't heard any issues happening with it yet. Uh, or at all um, but 
it's it's a concept that the Virginia Virginia Mason Virginia Mason concept was really integral to what they wanted to accomplish with the on stage off stage. Yeah, and one one interesting thing, um, you know, in terms of that model um, with the on stage off stage is the security um, that we had a lot of conversations with the MGB security team uh, around. You know, how do you as a provider, walk into this space um, and and feel secure, and and also you know be able to act, make a quick exit in case you get a behavioral health case that that isn't necessarily going uh, the way you had hoped. Um, and so there were a lot of considerations uh, around that, and how do we provide um, you know a means of of exit while also um, securing you know the the, the care team uh, with the workroom um, from patients just kind of waltzing in right so uh, a lot of discussions were had around around that as well so I see uh, Brandon asked about the private offices so we um you know had uh they the short answer is there's there's very there are very maybe very two private office space yeah there's very little of it it started with a bit more um but you know there's a lot of clinical program in this in this building and and it, it just they they kept adding more and so um you know they they unfortunately that that squeezed out some of the office space and some of the storage space um but we found creative solutions to mitigate that and and, and so you know, but but there aren't a whole lot of private offices. You know, <laughs> the idea is we want the providers out there in front of their patients. But they use the phone booths quite a bit. Um, yeah. So, the... so you know, this this diagram just kind of take you through, um, you know, a, a, pay, a practitioner journey and how they how do they utilize the entire building? Again, kind of demonstrating that this building, all three floors and inside, outside, and how well it's integrated and um, and the different stops that that um, a, a practitioner would take along their journey um, in, in, you know, in concert with uh, uh, with with their patients uh, and other staff. So, um, you know, I, I think it works quite well. And then this is the patient journey. So, you know, able to separate the uh, the provider journey and the patient journey, and then obviously have uh, critical moments of confluence where, where they're both in the same space. Um, but, you know, able to, to provide for, for the patient, um, you know, a good experience. And, uh, you know, this is showing uh, uh, how they might utilize the building if they start on level one after coming off uh, out of the parking area and then uh, have a surgical case. So uh, you can kind of see how that how that all works, um, you know, from entry to, to to exit. Patricia, this was a big part of your upfront planning, yeah, right? It was and using technology too for the patients. That's right. So much of the conversation was, what are those critical touch points? How do we think these these three floors as one big ecosystem? It even back to the conversation about mm -hmm. waiting room and the stairs that allowed us to have this decentralized waiting room. How do you think of this as one continuous? Um, space that you were able to use and navigate in different ways. Technology played a critical piece in how we wanted it to work day one and also informing how we wanted it to work in the future where technology that will exist then doesn't exist today. So a lot of the challenges and conversations around technology from a user experience of the self-rooming and the arrival experience and the waiting and how do you know you're greeted, a lot of it was how can we make it be really functional day one with the, what exists today, but also be predictive of things that will continue to evolve and eventually the waiting room where the needs will be even smaller than they are today. Or do you feel no? I feel like, how can you be greeted digitally? And a lot of conversations around the experience pre-arrival and post-arrival um, as they integrated into that broader experience as well. So, And, and also um, self-rooming too, right? That's right. That's right. The whole piece of self-rooming, how, how do you know where to go? How does, and understanding that folks who come in have a wide variety of digital capabilities and digital uh, fluency. So enabling you to be able to do it digitally, but also have the space be really clear to enable you to know where to go and how to, how to make self-learning work. Oh, so this is our most recently checklist. We're, we're almost there, getting all the construction and um, information in there. The project still isn't closed out completely, and I know Matt's probably involved in that. Um, but this is lead silver. Um, 
the other projects, Woburn and, and Westboro, we were shooting for lead gold. Um, and I don't know if Michael's still on the line, but I think a lot of it was um, the renewable energy production portion of the checklist. Mm -hmm. Things like, uh, you know, um, life cycle impact uh, reduction, things like that, we just couldn't achieve. Um, so we got 56 points, I think is what we're, we're ending up with, which is just a tab below what we needed for gold. Um, but always something to be approved upon. Uh, and, and it was determined, there was a, a timing of when they just figured out that it probably would be lead silver and not lead gold. Yeah, and I think one of the primary things that drove the, the lead silver designation at Salem as opposed to the gold aspiration was the fact that oddly enough, um, they didn't want us to install uh, solar in in the at the Salem site. So, um, you know, that was uh, unfortunate. Yeah, no. to, yeah, in the, they, in the, yeah, you're right. Matt, they the being the, the, the town, the town didn't want us to install yeah. it. Not, not MGB was ready. But I uh, thought it was. Yeah. So the Westburn, Woburn, and the um, photovoltaics over the parking lot was a big, a big um, part of the project. Yeah, but um, you know, as far as gold is concerned, you know, we also had, um, you know, uh, we we had done designs um, for a geothermal system uh, as well as the the, uh, the battery energy storage storage system uh, to try and um, you know utilize uh, solar energy when when the sun wasn't shining and and store that energy for use later. Um, so, but those systems did not make their way into the Salem built project. So, you know, this Teresa was talking about the lead, uh, the lead portion of the project. Um, uh, another thing that, that, you know, was very important to the client um, that we worked very uh, diligently to achieve is, you know, Mass General is one of the founding members, I believe, of the Healthy Hospital Initiative. Um, and so this is a material tracking sheet that you're seeing where we, um, you know, we listed out each of the interior materials. Um, and how how those were used and and what criteria they met and did not meet and used that as a basis to um, uh, you know to make a lot of our our our, our selections um, you know Anna Anna was uh, obviously uh, fundamental to that effort uh, in addition to, um, you know working very closely with us to make sure that that we were um, uh, meeting the project aspirations um, in that regard so uh, I think it, it came out very well. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, but uh, but time well spent, no doubt. So you know, these are just a couple couple finishing photos here. This is one of the general ORs. Um, this is uh, uh, you know we had uh, two of the ORs have three booms, and and two of them have two. So that's what you're looking at here. Um, but you know, very. Very clean room, a uh, lot of opportunity for, um, you know, there, we we provided a lot of flexibility here uh, with regard to, uh, you know, what we were what we were setting up in terms of power and med gas and everything else. So if they wanted to do, um, you know, something else in the future, uh, we tried to set them up as much as we could. Um, you know, hard to plan for what you don't know, but um, but I think we did a good job here. So. Um, so one of the things Consigli did was that they um, they did photo um, uh, photo shots. I'm not quite sure how they did it, but of each of where all the blocking is in these walls. So as we were assembling, you know, everything into the final configuration, a lot of times we had to refer to those photos to make sure that we had the blocking where we needed it, or we had to make a slight adjustments. Matt and I spent a lot of time in this room <laughs> with some of the elements trying to make that work. But those were really critical, I think, in terms of they now have a record of where all the blocking is in the building and for yeah, like that's talking about for future conduit. changes. Yeah, all in the conduit as well. It's just, as I think we all know, you know, what's going on behind those walls is very impressive. Uh, it's like a, you know, big bowl of spaghetti in there. So good to have that record um, so they don't have to open things up to figure out what's going on. Just a quick shot of the SPD. So you can see this is the dirty side. Um, so we have uh, uh, two washers uh, with room for a third um, and, uh, you know, your decontamined sinks, um, very clean, uh, sterile environment, or I guess not sterile on this side, sterile on the other. 
um, but with all the pass throughs, um, as well as uh, you can, you can't really see it over there. There's a metavator over there at the, at the back corner. Um, so, you know, this is having this on site at one point, we talked about perhaps doing a central SPD facility that would serve multiple sites. Um, but it was decided at the time to uh, to keep this this space in the building. Um, and, uh, you know, and they've, they've actually started surgical cases fairly recently, you know, I think a month and a half ago or so they had their first successful case. So um, they're all very excited about that. And this is back on level one. So you can see these screens here um, that, uh, that, that, you know, it's a similar pattern to uh, to, to the metal uh, in the grand stair, kind of trying to weave that that motif through the through the building. And of course, uh, lots of color, lots of wood. And uh, you can see, as Patricia was mentioning earlier, all of the primary corridors in the building terminate in in uh, uh, views to the outside and light. So um, you can kind of see how that's captured and and what it does to create such a nice space uh, inside. Thank you all so much. Yeah. There's a any, couple any questions. questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what's the providence of the metal panels? They're very nice. I'm sorry, the question was, what's the, the providence? The metal panel, which, you know, which metal panels are you talking about? The ones with the, the slots The divider in panels probably, yeah. Yeah, so those were just you know quarter inch thick metal panel. Um, uh, the pattern was etched cut um, and then uh, painted, um, uh, you know, painted uh, to 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 meet the the its its location wherever that may be, whether it be the stair and some of those sub waiting areas. So, thank you. I think that's it for the questions that we've received. If there's any other questions. Is there anything okay. you wish uh, turned out differently or lessons learned or? Hmm. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it, it was really, really a challenge doing all of this during COVID. And I actually started against her six weeks before the lockdown. So that was super challenging. So <laughs> I wish that had gone differently. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I think, I think everything came together really well, like every project it's, it has its challenges and, um, you know, but, but the, the thing that really allowed us to, to, to meet those challenges, I think was, was the sense of teamwork that we all had, you know, and, um, and that, you know, that it was, it's, it's really unique and I, I don't know that it's so unique, but it's, it's really great when, when you get a common sense of purpose, not just, you know, either the client and, and the, the design team and the construction team and, you know, your, your consultants, um, you know, like HGA and, and DIRT and everybody's got a common sense of purpose and we're all row, rowing in the same direction. And, and I think that that, you know, that I think is what allowed this to happen. And as Teresa mentioned, and, uh, you know, a lot of design changes during construction, but, you know, everybody just came together and, and uh, I think, you know, the results show, I think, I think uh, that that sense of teamwork and common purpose really, really made its way into the building. So yeah, we ended up using um, Smartsheet, uh, which probably a mm -hmm. bunch of you guys are familiar with to, to document decisions and responsibilities. It, it became especially critical as the building was being populated with furniture um, and all the equipment and coordinating with the logistics team. Um, every morning we would meet and discuss what was going to happen that day um, and hopefully check it off on Smartsheet. But uh, that was that was really critical. I wish we had done that even earlier at the earlier parts of all the user meetings so that we would have it really as a handy tool. Um, it was a little bit more traditional note taking at that point. Um, but I'm I'm all for now, you know, creating a decision making process mm -hmm. that everyone agrees upon and just really sticking to it and um, creating a, a document library of that. So I wish we had done a little bit more of that. Um, that's my big lesson learned, which I'm incorporating in my new work, my other projects. But um, I have a I don't know if my camera is working. I've been having some challenges. So sorry if it's not it's not intentional. Uh, I have. Okay, great. I have a technical question that's 
streaming from the inside knowledge of the project. Did you uh, did you end up uh, in radiology uh, using the uh, model that's at the assembly row site with the stretcher uh, with the MRI um, table moving in and out of the room, or is it uh, self uh, walking patients? Yeah, no, they we we looked into that, but um, but we ended up using the fixed table. Um, okay, you, know, you have a fixed what table. It, right. What it really came down to in this case was was size was space um, because right. you know to have the mobile table, you uh, you, you know your 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 holding bays need to be very large to to fit the table, and and then you have to have the space to get the table from that bay into uh, into the uh, the MRI room. So. We just didn't have the space, unfortunately. We looked into it and tried very hard to make it work, but we were yeah. successful. In that we, room. Yeah, we toured so the assembly row is... space. Um, it, it was just, it's a beautiful, beautifully designed space, and and it's just this it's just much bigger floor plate, unfortunately, like Matt was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was just curious because it because it is a prototypical decision, as you as, and as you know, we were actually doing the uh, assembly row model. Um, in Westwood, so um, I guess we have uh, two approaches. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question from Sarah Markovitz on the chat. Can you summarize the innovations changes from earlier renditions of ambulatory care? Well, I think I, I don't know, Patricia. Do you want to do you want to talk about that or talk about free, it? Free, free, I'm free, free, talking free. a lot here. No, no, go for it. Go for it. Okay, so I, I think the thing that is unique to this, and 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 one of the big aspirations of the project from the outset was the integration of the service lines. You know, the integration of the care modalities. So, so you really is kind of intended to be, you know, one spot to get all of your care in an ambulatory setting. So you don't have to go down the street to get your MRI and then go across town to get your your surgery done. So I think that, you know, is really one of the big things here uh, in terms of how we try to push push the envelope on on how care is delivered in an integrated fashion um, makes the patient part of the care team. Um, and so that's, I think, um, you know, how I would how I would answer that question. I think that's right. And I think the, the patient experience piece, a lot of conversation was dedicated to that. Not that it isn't in more traditional ambulatory care, but how do you have autonomy? How do you have more choice around which, how do you room? How do you, having more sense of like you're driving, you're driving in, what spaces do you use? Um, what waiting room do you wait at? There's a quiet loud, there's a loud lounge on the side. So a little bit more diversity in those um, or patient experience facing spaces. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Are there any reports yet so far as to how the building is operating and, and what the throughput, the volume, or the revenue is? And how, how is MGB enjoying the building? Well, I think that the, the staff absolutely love the building. Uh, the patients that I've spoken to absolutely love the building. I've spent quite a bit of time up there, you know, post CFO. Um, and, you know, they, as I mentioned, they just started their surgical cases. So, um, you know, they're not, uh, they're, they're ramping up capacity, you know, and it's really the ASC on the, on the third floor is really what's going to drive a lot of that. Um, and so, you know, we'll, they'll, they're, they're going to continue to ramp up through years two and three, um, and until they get to full capacity, but not, not just here that yet, there yet. Uh, Thank you. Um, any, anyone else? Okay. Well, I just, you know, go ahead, thank, Cindy. Yeah, thank you to the Gensler team. Oh, this is an amazing pro project, and um, there's so many partners who are also on this call. Teresa, Michael Lorimer, Anna Mancini, Jessica Finch, Tim King. So many others who touched this project. Um, I think many of us have seen it or known about it. And um, it's just a very beautiful outcome. So kudos to everyone who's really put their heart and soul into it. Um, and thank you for sharing with the BSA crew. Uh, we really, really appreciate uh, 
you know, sharing the project and your knowledge and your lessons learned with everyone uh, with this, you know, our Boston uh, design and architecture community. So thank you so much.